ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, grab your Bible or your app or your Etch-a-Sketch, whatever you read your Bible on. Dude, if you're, if you're reading your Bible on an Etch-a-Sketch, kudos, impressive. Uh, just getting it from home to here would be a challenge. But turn to Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 27, uh, if you're not familiar with the Bible, Luke is in the New Testament, so about two-thirds of the way uh, into the book. Uh, you'll find a group of familiar names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you get to Acts or Romans, uh, Corinthians, you've gone too far. If you're in a bunch of names that sound Old Testament-y, like kind of strange, you haven't gone far enough. Um, so if you have no idea where you're at, look at the table of contents. That's what God gave it to us for, so uh, don't be ashamed to look at that. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, feel free to grab one out of the pew, and if you don't have one at home, take that Bible home with you. We want you to have a Bible at your house, and so those Bibles in the pews are there for you. Take one with you. Now, Levi threw the best parties. Anytime Levi threw a party, everybody wanted to be there. Levi's parties were the ones that everyone wanted to be a part of. They always had the best people, the most fun people, the most outgoing, energetic, uh, have a good time type of people. The food at Levi's parties was always the best spread. It, it was never a letdown. The food was always amazing. The entertainment at Levi's parties, you would always talk about it for weeks afterwards because of how good the entertainment was. And so tonight, she sat there at the table and listened to the guy that Levi had brought. Now, she had everything in life. She didn't have anything to complain about. She was living the dream. She had all the money that she could ever need. She had all the possessions that she would ever want. She had her independence. She could do whatever she wanted whenever she wanted to do it. She had all the friends that a person could need in a lifetime. And she had men lining up at her door, buying her gifts and loving on her. She had everything she could possibly need or want. She had it good. And she sat at that table and listened to the man at the end talk. And she started thinking about her life. And she started to realize that as she listened to this guy, maybe all of the money and the independence and the friends weren't all it was stacked up to be. Maybe all the men lining up at her door to show her love and to shower her with gifts, maybe, maybe that wasn't love at all. She stopped and sat at that table and, and listened to the guy at the end, talk, and she realized that all that love wasn't making her feel loved at all. She actually felt used. She felt empty. And so she sat there at the table, and she listened to the guy at the end. And that man at the end of the table was talking about a true and pure love, and that she could have it if she wanted it. And she sat there and thought, how could this guy invite me into this love? Does he not know who I am? Wait, let's not kid ourselves. He knows exactly who I am. He knows exactly what I do. He knows exactly what all of us sitting at this table do. Because we're not exactly the crowd that's upstanding in our society. We're not exactly the crowd that the religious people hang out with all the time. As a matter of fact, the religious people standing in the corner of the room that very night were judging her and thinking horrible thoughts about her and putting her down. And the great part was, is the man at the end of the table shut them up and put them in their place, which was amazing. And she sat at the table and listened to the man. And realized that the love that he offered could change her life. So she sat and she listened. Now all of this happened in the evening, but it actually started 
earlier in the day. So take your Bibles and look with me at Luke 5, starting in verse 27. Luke 5, verse 27, it says, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at the disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amazing story, right? What an account of life change. I mean, Jesus walks up to this guy who he does not know, says, follow me. Levi goes, okay, and then starts following him. And not just that, Levi threw a party so that all of his sinner friends could meet Jesus. What a great account. But there's a few things I want you to notice in this passage. The first thing I want you to notice is that Jesus invites you into life change. Jesus invites you into To life change. You see, Jesus loves and cares for each and every one of us. And I'm not talking about the mass of people that are sitting here right now. While he does love us, I'm talking to you as an individual. I'm talking to you as a person. Jesus loves and cares for you. And you may be sitting in the pew right now thinking, Oh, see, that's great and everything, but you don't know me. You don't know my past. You don't know the guilt that I live with day in and day out. You don't know the decisions I made this morning that Jesus wouldn't approve of. I don't know them, but Jesus does, and he makes it clear in his word that he doesn't care. He loves you. Jesus cares for you right where you're at. If you want proof of that, look at this passage. He called Levi, who was a tax collector. Now, in Jesus' day and time, the tax collectors were the kings of the sinners. There was no one in Jesus' society that was more hated and more looked down upon than the tax collector. Because what was a tax collector? A tax collector in Jesus' time was someone who was a Jew... You know, an Israelite who worked for the Romans, the foreign power who had come in and taken over Israel and taken away their freedoms. And he, the tax collector, was working for the Roman government and taking the Jews' money and giving it to the Romans. So not only was the tax collector not looked highly upon, he was considered a full-on traitor to the nation of Israel. His fellow Israelites, his fellow Jewish people, looked at him as a full-on traitor living among them. And so most tax collectors, from what we know of history, embraced that, and they were the sinners of the sinners. I mean, they threw the big parties. They were the ones encouraging people to walk away from God and embrace a, a horrible lifestyle. They were the worst And who is it that Jesus walks right up to in his tax booth and says, follow me? The tax collector. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you have done. There's nothing you can do in the future that will change how much Jesus loves and cares for you. It's a fact. There is an unconditional love that comes from Jesus Christ that we have a hard time comprehending. And today, this morning, could be the starting point for you sitting in this room. This could be the starting point for you to begin a journey of life change with Jesus. Because here's how this works. Jesus was and is God. And he decided to come out of heaven 
sacrifice all he had, and live on this earth as a man. And while he lived here, he lived a completely sinless life. In other words, he did not make any mistakes against God's law. And at the end of his life, he died on a cross. And when he died on that cross, he took all of our mistakes, all of our sins, all of our rebellion against God, and he took all of that on himself. James chapter 5 says that if we commit one sin, if we're guilty of breaking one of God's laws, we're guilty of breaking them all. But he took all of your, all of my sins, past, present, and future, and he took them on himself so that you and I would not receive what we rightly deserve, the punishment that we deserve. He took that on himself so that instead of going to hell and getting the punishment that we've earned, we get to go to heaven. He took the punishment for you. That's love. He loves you. And he asked that you just simply step into a life-changing relationship with him and follow him. Just like he looked at Levi and said, follow me. The same invitation is extended to you. Follow me. So what's holding you back this morning from stepping into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? What guilt, what questions are keeping you from saying, yes, I want to live in a life-changing relationship. Because that relationship is exactly what we're describing. It will change your life. So what's preventing you? This morning, after the end of this service, uh, after we've dismissed, everybody's going to stand up and and talking on their way out. We're going to have two places for you to come and ask those questions and have an opportunity to step into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Uh, We'll have some prayer team up here at the front. You can talk to one of them. We'll have this room over here to your right. You can go back there and we'll have some pastors and leaders that would love to answer any of your questions or help you begin a relationship with Jesus this morning. So what is preventing you from taking that step today? Because Jesus loves and cares for you. You see, Jesus is not calling us to be religious He's calling us to be in relationship. And there's a huge difference. Religion teaches us. Religious people believe that you have to earn your way to heaven. They have a mentality that if I do enough good things, then Jesus will smile at me and he'll let me in the gates of heaven. But that's not how it works. You cannot do enough good deeds. You can't give enough money to the poor. You can't sacrifice enough of your time helping other people to get your way into heaven. It's not how it works. It's not what you do. It's who you know that gets you into heaven. It's about a relationship. So if you think you can earn your way, if you think, well, I'm a good person, I'll get there, that's not how it works. It's only through a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't do enough. It's only through a relationship with Jesus Christ that you can go to heaven. So what's stopping you from taking that step this morning? Because Jesus loves and cares for you. He invites you to life change. But he doesn't just invite you. He invites others to life change also. Jesus invites others to life change. It's not just an invitation to us, it's an invitation to everyone. I mean, think about Levi's party. He came and hung out with all sorts of people and extended that invitation of life change to everyone there. The invitation is open to everyone. But here's the hard part in that. That means that some of the people that you think don't deserve it or would never accept Jesus, are actually the ones that Jesus is knocking at their door. The fact is, is let's be honest. You don't have to raise your hand. I'm not asking that. But let's be honest. We all look at people through the lens of judgment, don't we? We do. You can't deny it. We look at people, and whether we do it subconsciously or we do it consciously, uh, we look at somebody and go, yeah, no, I'm not going to mess with that person. Yeah, I'll go talk to this one, but I'm not going to go talk to this one because I don't want to have anything to do with them. 
But we need to adjust the way we look at people. We need to realize that who did Jesus hang out with? If you go and read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the the stories about Jesus' life, who did Jesus hang out with? He didn't hang out with the goody two-shoes and the religious people. He hung out with the sinners, with the fishermen, with the ordinary, everyday people. Not the spiritual superstars, but the everyday person. Everyone is invited to step into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not a closed invite. It's open to everyone. Let's face it. We're all sinners in need of a Savior, aren't we? Every single one of us. I, standing up here in front of you, have committed sins day in and day out. Um, I probably did some this morning on my way here this morning. I mean, we are sinners in need of a Savior. And let me be honest, I sin differently than you sin. My struggles, my temptations are different than your struggles and your temptations. And let's be honest, let's extend that out. Your struggles and temptations and sins are different from the ones that the people you hang out with are. The people you hang out with have different struggles than you have and sin differently. But does that mean that they're any more or less worthy of God's invitation to life change? No. We can't judge people based on the way they sin versus the way we sin because we're all sinners. And the fact is is that Jesus calls every single one of us to turn our back on our sin and embrace that life-changing relationship with him. So he invites you, he invites others into life change. But here's the hard part. You are Jesus' invitation into that life change. You are the invitation that Jesus extends out to li- for life change. I hope you remember this from a few months back. J- uh, Chad quoted this uh, study. I'm going to quote it again. Current studies reveal to us that somewhere around 60% of people who do not attend church would attend a church if someone they knew asked them or invited them to come. 60%, 6 out of 10 people would come to church if we simply invited them to come with us. Now, many of you know my story. I didn't grow up in a Christian household Uh, Not to say it wasn't a good home. I had a great upbringing. I had a great family. My mom and dad were amazing, but we never went to church. Even on Christmas and Easter, we didn't go to church. It just wasn't something that ever crossed our mind in my home. We never even had those discussions of, well, should we go to church this weekend? It is Christmas Eve. That was never even a discussion point in my home. There was never even a by thought of church in my house. And so I grew up in an unchristian home, and when I was in middle school, one of my buddies named Jeremy Stallings uh, walked up to me one Wednesday afternoon, and he goes, hey, Chad, hey, you want to come to youth group with me tonight? And I said, yeah, but uh, I don't have a ride. And he goes, don't worry about it. My mom and dad will come pick you up. We'll, We'll make sure you get there. I was like, okay. And so I went to youth group that night with my friend Jeremy, and my life changed that night. Because I realized uh, at my, the pastor's home of that church where they, we had youth group, I realized in that home that Christ offered to me, someone who was not a Christian, who did not grow up in a Christian home, who was not exactly a goody two-shoe, I realized at that person's house that night that Christ loves me, even me. And I'm standing before you now as a pastor Now, do you think I would be standing on this stage had Jeremy Stallings not asked me that one simple question, hey man, you want to come to youth group with me tonight? It wouldn't have happened. That one sentence changed the entire trajectory of the rest of my life. And, let's be honest, it changed my eternity because my friend had the courage to ask one single sentenced question question. Hey, you want to come to youth group tonight? Let me be very honest as someone who didn't grow up in church. This, to an unbeliever, to someone who's never been in church, this is scary. This is intimidating. Because think about it for a second. 
someone coming in to this building who's never come here before is basically coming into a room with two to three hundred people who all have something in common. All say the same thing, speak the same language. They know the building. They have friends here. And you're asking someone who's a stranger and has not, doesn't have that thing in common and is not familiar with this building to come in and just fit right in. That's like me asking you to come to a Hell's Angels rally and you don't even own a motorcycle. <laughs> to an unchurched person, we laugh, but it's that scary. It is. But if someone said, hey, I'll sit with you, I'll hold your hand, I'll coddle you, I'll walk you through the process, I'll cuddle a little bit if you need that, whatever you need, I'll be here for you. If somebody said that when they invited, how much more likely or more comfortable would that person feel coming into this room right here? If they knew they had a friend, if they knew they had somebody who would walk with them and talk with them and and sit with them and, and do whatever they needed to make them feel secure in here, how much more likely would they be to say, yeah, I'll come to church rather than just coming on their own? You see, we are the invitation. Here's what uh, Romans 10, 13, and 14 says. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? How are we supposed to expect our friends and family and co-workers to come to know Christ if we don't invite them to come to know Christ? Oh, it's just going to miraculously happen. No, it doesn't work like that. There's this thing called the Great Commission where Jesus commanded us to be the ones to invite them in. Jesus doesn't do it without us. We're part of the process. We're the instruments. Now, I'm not uh, saying that... uh, miraculous things don't happen. I'm saying in this context, Jesus wants us to be the ones who are doing the inviting, the invitations. So let me put it in a different perspective for you. Think about it this way. Let's say you get a boat and you're driving your boat down the lake and you're trucking along. It's a beautiful day. The water's clear. The breeze is hitting you and it's just a wonderful day. And off in the distance, you see something like flapping around in the water. And you go, huh, wonder what that is. Go check it out. Don't have anything better to do. So you drive your boat towards this thing flapping around the water. And as you get closer, you realize that's a person. It's a person like struggling and drowning. And so you get closer. And as you get closer, you realize that's not just any person. That's a person I know that I care about, that I love, that I have relationship with. And you come up next to the person, you look out and you go, I don't know how to swim, I only doggy paddle. What am I going to do? And so you'll start looking around your boat and down in the corner of your boat, you see a stack of life preservers. And you think back, oh yeah, there was this guy who saved me when I was drowning. And he threw a life preserver out to me and saved me. And then he gave me all of these life preservers and told me that if I appreciated him saving me, to go save anyone else that I ever saw drowning. And so you grab one of the life preservers and what do you do next? Do you make excuses? Oh, you know, I got this old football injury that uh, prevents me from really being able to throw a life preserver properly, so I'm just going to keep going and let that person drown. Or do we question ourselves? Do we go, oh, but if I throw this life preserver out to them and I pull them in and they start asking me questions that I don't know the answers to and I don't know what I'm going to do. And so you take your boat and you keep driving and let the person drown? How does that make sense? I hope that everyone in this room would see the life preserver and despite our questions and our doubts in ourselves, we would throw the preserver out to them and save them because we care more about the person than our own insecurities. Your friends, your co-workers, your family members who don't know Christ are spiritually drowning. Their eternity is on the line. So why aren't we throwing the life preservers out to them? 
I would venture to say that if any one of us was in the situation physically where we had the opportunity and we had the equipment to save somebody who was drowning, we would instantly do it without thinking twice, right? So why don't we do it when it comes to people's eternity? How much more important is someone's eternity than the measly few years we have in this horrible existence on earth? Why are we so preoccupied with our insecurities and our, our, our doubts that we don't invite people to come to church with us? Notice what I just said there. I'm not asking you to carry a pamphlet around in your pocket that you can whip out and throw out the four spiritual laws and lead someone to Christ. Three quarters of you have no idea what I just said. <laughs> I'm not asking you to be a biblical scholar that can quote Bible chapter and verse day in and day out. I'm not asking you to have a memorized script that you can lead someone to Christ at a moment's notice. I'm asking you to invite someone to church. We invite people to things all the time. So why don't we invite them to something that will change their life and their eternity? Why are we so preoccupied with our own insecurities and doubts that we won't help someone salvation, their eternity, their forever? You are, I am, we are the invitation to people who don't know Christ. And guys, we try and make things very easy for you to invite here at Calvary. You know, when, when you ask somebody to come to church with you, what are the first two questions? How long is it gonna be, and what do I have to wear, right? Even if they don't ask it, they're thinking it in the back of their mind. And that's why, here at Calvary, our services are an hour long, because anybody you have relationship with will go through horrible torture for at least an hour for you. <laughs> they will. Now you start getting into the two hour and three hour range, people are gonna go, yeah, I'm not interested in being tortured and, and ridiculed that long, I'm not gonna do it. But we keep it at an hour so that you can look at your friends and say, hey, it's only an hour, why don't you come with me? I'll take you out to eat afterwards. I'll make it worth your while. And, and they ask, well, what do I have to wear? Well, I'm looking out right now and there's at least a quarter of you in t-shirts. When, when it warms up, what does everybody wear to Calvary? Board shorts and t-shirts. You can wear whatever you want. Let's face it, nobody owns a suit in Havasu. And if they do, they hate wearing it anyways. So we make it casual here. I mean, Chad preaches half the time in a Cardinals jersey. We intentionally make it easy for you to go to your friend and say, hey, Want to come to church with me Sunday morning? It's only an hour. You can dress whatever you want to. You, you just fine. And I'll take you out afterwards. Why are we not throwing out those life preservers? Why are we not living out the invitation that Jesus calls us to be? We've got a great opportunity in front of us. Uh, we have a, a, a small window right now. You may have noticed as you came here on the highway, there's a big building being built right across the highway from Dairy Queen. And that building, I guarantee you, the vast majority of people, when they drive down the highway and they look over at that building, what are they thinking? They're going, that's kind of cool. I wonder what it looks like. Those people who do not come to Calvary or do not go to church, they're curious about what the inside of that building looks like. And if I tell you that statistically, six out of ten people will come to church with you if you simply invite them. Because of the new building, I would say it's more like eight out of ten. Because that building is the new shiny thing in town. And let's face it, we're all like fish. We see something shiny, and whether it's dangerous or not, we swim toward it because we're curious. The great thing is, is because they're curious... We can invite them because they want to come check it out and maybe we'll get them hooked. Maybe we'll get them hooked on Christ. Maybe they'll come in just to check out a cool new building in town and they'll stay because they experience a life-changing relationship with their Savior. We have a beautiful opportunity in front of us and your friends want you to invite them to check out the new building. We've heard from the contractor that we really, 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 really should be in by Easter. 
and we're crossing our fingers and we're praying and we're hoping and, and we're, hope, we're hope, helplessly desiring that we get in there. I mean, there's nothing we can do about it, but it's all in God's hands. But that's just a couple months away. You have a couple of months where you can start working on your friends and your family and your coworkers that want to see the building anyway, and you're the invitation. I'm a big fan of the staff here. Obviously, I'm on the staff. So I'm a big fan of the staff here at Calvary, but let's be honest, the staff here at Calvary does not have connection with the 35 to 40,000 unchurched people in this community. But I could guarantee you that if every person who attends Calvary, if we were surveyed, I bet you we've got connections with almost every 35 to 40,000 of the people that are out there that need Christ. We can't do it on our own. We need you. We need you to be the invitation. And so what's preventing you from just saying, hey, you want to come to church with me Sunday? Come check out the new building. It's pretty cool. What's stopping you? So here's the challenge. And Chad's been throwing this out for six, eight, nine, 12 months. I don't know, something like that. Who are the two or three people in your life, coworkers, friends, family, whoever it is, who are the two or three people? And I would venture to say, because of the likelihood that they'll say yes to come check out the new building, who are the eight people that you need to invite to church? Because, guys, I'm not talking about them coming and checking out a new building, obviously. I'm calling you to invite them to step into a life-changing relationship with Jesus that will permanently alter their eternity. Who are the people that you need to start thinking about inviting? Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for Levi uh, and the amazing excitement that he had when he was invited into that invitation that Jesus gave to follow me. Lord, I thank you that Levi was so willing and so ready that not only did he follow, but then he invited all of his friends. And Lord, I pray that if there is anyone in this room who does not have a life-changing relationship with Christ, but they want one, that they would have the courage at the end of the service to go back to this room to their right or talk to one of the prayer team members up here at the front and begin the process of stepping into a life-changing relationship with Jesus and place on our hearts the names of the people that we need to invite to church so that they can come experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus as well. So Lord, we thank you. And we praise you, and we lift all of these things up to you in his name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and worship.